All right, so once again, this video is going to be for those of you who are just not with us right now. Um, but if you're in class and you want to watch this to kind of refresh your memory or go over anything that maybe you, you didn't really understand when we're in class, you can watch this as well, but it is not mandatory. And what we're learning next is direct variation. So two quantities, x and y, show direct variation when y is equal to k times x, where k is a number that cannot be equal to zero. And the number K is called a constant proportionality. So meaning if we can represent a whole bunch of uh, quantities that Y is equal to some number, the same number times every single X, then we would say that there's a direct variation. So let's just give you an example real quick. If I say um, X, Y, let's just say zero, zero, uh, let's say one, two, and two, and four. Well, these are all in a direct variation um, because... All of these, I can say y is equal to 2 times x, because if for the first one, uh, if I do y is equal to 2 times x, well, 0 is equal to 2 times 0, because that would be our y value 0, so correct. Here, 2 is equal to 2, because I'm saying 2 times uh, x, 2 times 1, which is my x value, and 2 times 1 is 2, which would equal my y. Here, I'm saying 4 is equal to 2 times 2, my direct variation, plus my x value, and that would be equal to 4. So you see, all of these, I can multiply my x value to get to my y by 2. So since I can multiply every single uh, x by the same number, we would say that there is a direct variation, and that k is called our constant of proportionality. All right? Um, so it just means that they're all proportional, means that they would form a straight line. So when we're just talking about direct variation in general, um, and not necessarily as a graph, um, we just have to just make sure that we can rewrite it as y is equal to k times x, where k represents some number uh, that just can't be zero. Because if k was equal to zero, then every single number times k would always be equal to zero. So uh, it would just end up being the equation of y is equal to zero. Um, all right, so that's why it just cannot be zero. Um, but now when we talk about it in terms of our graph and what we're learning now is um, we represent y is equal to kx, where k uh, represents our slope. So this k is actually representing the slope or the steepness of our graph. And the one thing that you have to understand is it passes through the origin. And remember, the origin is where our x and our y axis intercept. So it's this point here where they both intercept. That is the order pair 0, 0. And that is our origin. So if the graph does not fall through that origin, even if we can say, oh, well, we're multiplying them all by some number, uh, it would not be um, a direct variation because it has to pass through the um, origin. And we're actually going to see that when it doesn't pass through the origin, there's going to be a number that's added to it. So it wouldn't just be y is equal to 2x. In order for it not to pass through the origin, there has to be something being added or subtracted to this as well. Uh, and then that addition or subtraction no longer makes it a direct variation, even though our x is being multiplied by the same number every time, because this plus or minus is going to move it off of that um, origin. Uh, so it no longer would be referred to as a direct variation. All right. Uh, so two quantities that show direct variation are proportional in relationship. All right. Uh, but the important thing that we have to remember is when we're talking about direct variation with us right now, it must pass through the origin of our graph. So if it doesn't pass through the origin, even though they're both being multiplied by the same number, uh, we wouldn't say it is a direct variation. OK, um, so now what I'm going to do is we're going to go through what some of these graphs look like um, before we move on to some problems. All right. So um, what we're seeing now is. Uh, y is equal to x. So you see, I just graphed our very basic uh, function. Nothing's being happened to it, just y is equal to x. So you see, um, our, this would be a direct variation because it is just y is equal to some number times x. And as we know, when there's no number written in front of our variable, the coefficient, we understand it's 1. So in this case, y is equal to 1 times x, and our k will be 1. So you see uh, our change in y going up 1, our change in x. So every single time, we can just multiply our x by 1 to get our y value. 3 times 1, that gives us our y value of 3. 4 times 1, that gives us our y value of 4. So now we're going to graph this y is equal to 2x. And let's just see what happens in comparison to our first graph that we have. And we're going to learn next year that this red graph is actually referred to as our parent function of a linear graph. We don't need to know that right now. But when we show this blue one, y is equal to 2x. So in this case, our k will be 2. So every single x value is being multiplied by 2. So you see 1 times 2 gives me 2. And there's that point where our y value is equal to 2. 
two times two gives me four. So you see it's now going to be passing where y value is four. And that would happen with all of these. It would give us six, eight, ten, and so on. But remember, the, the main thing we have to remember is that it is passing through the origin. So if this blue line did not pass through the origin, even though they're all being multiplied by two, we wouldn't say it is a direct variation. All right, so now I'm going to show this third one where it's y is equal to one half times x because it doesn't just have to be whole numbers. And it could also be negative numbers as well, but we're only going to focus on positive for right now. Um, but it doesn't have to be numbers greater than one. It could be numbers less than one. But let's see what happens when it is a number less than one. So here is our green line. So you see now we're multiplying every x value by a half. So when I multiply two by one half, that will give me one. So you see that's the point where it's one. When I multiply four by one half, that will give me two. So there's my point where it's two. When I multiply six by one half, it gives me three. So you see they're all being multiplied by the same value and it's passing through our origin. And if you notice, our red was our original function where it was just being multiplied by one. When we multiplied it by a number that was greater than one, it became more steep. So if the number is greater than one, or the, if, if the constant, the K, is larger than another k, that graph will be more steep. You see here, one half is being multiplied by x, and that is the least steepness of the three. So you see that the two is the steepest graph, the one is right in the middle, and then the one half is the one that's the least steep. So the larger the number k that we have, if we look at the um, absolute value of it, uh, that's going to be the one that is going to be increasing uh, at a more rapid pace. I just want to point that out to you. Now, when we look at these next graphs, here I see, well, the X has a one in front of it, just like we did this first one. However, it's now plus one. So what happens when we add something to it? So you see it no longer is passing through the origin, even though we could try and say, oh, well, every single X is being multiplied by the same number, but it's not going to be one times one gives me one anymore because it's being added. So you see, since it no longer passes through the origin, we wouldn't say that it has a direct variation. And the same thing here, we have two X plus three, which we've already done. Uh, with the 2x, but now as we see, it's not passing through the origin either. So even though every x is being multiplied by 2, we wouldn't say it's a direct variation because it has to pass through the origin. All right. So once we start adding or subtracting something to it, they're no longer going to pass through the origin anymore. Uh, so therefore, they would not be considered direct variations. So it just has to be a constant k times our x. And if there's anything being added or subtracted to it, it is not going to pass through the origin. All right, so now we're going to go through a couple problems of being able to identify. Um, and there's a couple ways I'm going to go through with how you can identify this. Um, but for now, we're just going to go through by graphing. All right, so this one, it says, tell whether X and Y show direct variation. Explain your reasoning. When I look at this chart right away, I know it doesn't. Because remember, in order for it to be direct variation, it must pass through the origin. And our origin has an order pair of zero, zero. Well, when I look at this order pair here where my X is two and my Y is zero, it's impossible then for it to pass through the origin because I'm already going through this order pair where my X is two and my Y is zero. So I know it's not going to pass through um, my origin because it's passing through where Y is zero here. So right away on this one, I don't even have to do anything because I see it's not passing through the point zero, zero because it gave me a order pair where one of the X or Y was zero and the other one wasn't. So it's impossible for it to be a direct variation. But the way that you can check for this is just go ahead and plot all these points. We have one, negative two. So I'm just gonna label these uh, A, B, C, D, just so that way um, when I label them on a graph, uh, you, you don't need to label these on the graph when you're doing it, but just in case you guys are struggling with the graphing part of it, I'm just gonna label them. So we have uh, A, B, C, D. So let me just first, we have A. Here we have two zeros, and then we have B. Here we have three, two. So we have C, and then here we have 4, 4, and D. So when we're graphing this, first off, it must form a straight line in order, in order for it to be a direct variation, and these do. So these do form a straight line. So if we're graphing, we might think, hey, maybe it does form a direct variation because there's a straight line. However, it must pass through the origin, and clearly it does not pass through the origin here. So we would say, no, uh, this does not uh, have direct variation. Um, and... We can identify just by saying here, well, first off, I see that we passed through a point two zero, and since y is zero and x is not also zero, it means it's impossible for it to be a straight line and pass through the origin since it's already passing through somewhere else along our coordinate plane. Or we can plot the points like we did and to show that uh, either A, they don't form a straight line, because if they don't form a straight line, then it's not a direct variation. 
uh, or B, it's not passing through the origin. All right, so let's go ahead and do one more problem with this. All right, so for this one, I'm going to go ahead and show you a few different ways as well. Once again, we can always just graph. So if you feel most comfortable saying, hey, I just want to graph it, see if it forms a straight line, see if it passes through the origin, by all means. So we have the point zero, zero, that will be our point A. I'm just going to label that over here. Here we have the point two, two, that would be our point B. Here we have four, four, that would be our point C. And here we have six, six, and that would be my point D. So when I do graph these, you'll use a straight edge when you're in class. You would see, okay, this does form a straight line and it does pass through our origin. So yes, this is a direct variation. And you would explain it if since it says explain your reason, you would say it is a straight line that passes through the origin. That's all you need to say. All right. The other way that you can do this as well is we can try and to see, we know our direct variation is y is equal to k times x. So I can look at all these ordered pairs and see, is there a number that I can multiply every x to to get to my y? And since I see that they're all the same, well, x times y, I can say, well, my k is going to be equal to one. Uh, x times one. Uh, will give me that y value every single time. So you can also just look at the relationship here and you can say, oh, well, uh, every number is being multiplied by one to get to, um, every x is being multiplied by one to get to my y. So I can say my k is equal to one and you can explain that in words and you can talk about the relationship. So we can graph them um, and look, look at it or we can talk about the relationship we see. The problem is though, is if you can say that these are all being multiplied by the same number, um, just make sure uh, that it's not being multiplied and being added. So make sure that it is just straight up just multiplying and nothing else. So if you have to multiply and then add something to get to the next number, then we know it's not a direct variation. All right, so that's ways that we can do it when we're given a table. Now we're gonna go through a couple examples when we're given an equation to determine if it is a direct variation or not. All right, so for these, we're given an equation and not a table. So when you're given an equation and you want to determine if it's a direct variation, what you want to do is solve for y. So you want to isolate your y all by itself and then see what kind of relationship forms. So for this one, we have x times y. So if I want to get y by itself, I need to divide by x because x divided by x is going to cancel out. So now I'm just left with y is equal to 3 over x. So remember, in order for it to be a direct variation, it's y is equal to k times x. Well, in this one, x has to be in the numerator. Here we're dividing by x. So we can't rewrite this as a way of some number being multiplied to x because x is in our denominator. It's what we're dividing by. So this is no, it is not a direct variation because we can't just multiply every single x by some number to get to our y um, because we're dividing by x. So for here, if I wanted to isolate y all by itself, well, we can think about this as x is equal to y over three. So we know that this is divided by three. So the inverse of division is multiplication. So I can multiply each side by three. And now I get y is equal to three x. And since nothing's being added or subtracted to it, it is simply written as y is equal to some number times x. Yes, this is a direct variation. And then our last one, if I wanted to isolate my y here, since we're adding one to it, I'd have to subtract one. Now I get y is equal to x minus one. And this one, we know that no, it is not a direct variation because we are subtracting that one from it. All right. It needs to just be a number times x and nothing else happened to it. So if there's anything being added or subtracted or dividing by x, then right away, just by looking at the equation, we can say, no, this is not a direct variation. All right. There's one more example that we're going to go through, mainly because I want to talk about uh, sometimes we need to manipulate our graphs a little bit. And then that's it for this video. All right. So for this one, I mainly want to go through this one just to show you that sometimes we do need to manipulate our uh, graphs. So if you see here, this graph, we're only focusing on quadrant one. So here's our Y axis here. So you see, it's my Y axis and here's my X axis. So rather than focusing on all four quadrants here, we're only going to focus on quadrant one for this one. Uh, and I'll explain why we're doing that in just a moment. But then also you see there's no numbers written. So we're going to actually fill in our own numbers when we're doing this, uh, because sometimes we do need to manipulate our graphs and sometimes we're not going to count by ones in both for our X and our Y. And we don't have to count by the same when we're going along our Y axis and when we're going along our X axis. We can count by different numbers. And that's where we have to then make sure we're paying attention to what the graph is showing, because we might just assume that every single graph we see is counting by one every time. So make sure you're looking at the numbers on the axis to make sure that you are counting by ones or they're counting by twos or fives or tens. So make sure that you are paying attention to what we are counting by. So one, it says the table shows the area in square feet that a robotic vacuum cleans in X minutes. So our X represents our minutes. Well, 
we can't ever have negative time. We can't go backwards in time. Um, so that's why we're only going to focus on the positive part where X is positive in our graph. And then also the Y represents in square feet, uh, the area that this um, robotic um, vacuum is cleaning. And since you can't clean a negative area, we don't need to worry about where any Y values are negative or where any X values are negative. So that's why we only need to focus on this quadrant one because both our X and Y will be positive. So that's why I'm just focusing on this here. And you see in our minutes, we're talking about half of a minute, one minute, one and a half minute and two minutes. So we're not counting by ones. So that's why I got a graph here also that didn't show uh, any uh, numbers counted for. So what I'm going to do is every one of these lines going up and going up and down are going to represent a half a minute. So I'm going to just label one here. I'll label two here, three here, four, five and six. You don't have to necessarily label every single, so this will be zero. You don't have to label every single line because if I see, okay, this is one and there's one line in between that and every single one, one to two, there's one in between, two to three, there's one in between and so on. Then that means that that line in between is representing a half. So we don't have to write one half, one, one and a half, two, two and a half. We can space out how much we're going to count in the whole numbers. And then the lines in between, as long as if they're consistent in between each line, then the reader will know, okay, well, each of those lines represents one half. If I wanted those lines to represent a third, well, then I would have to have done one third, two thirds, and one. So my one would have been here. And then just to make sure I'm consistent, one, two, and then my third one, two would have been here. And then each one of those lines would have represented one third instead. All right. So now I'm counting by halves along my X axis. If I try to count by halves along my Y axis, I would need a huge, huge, huge coordinate plane. So I'm just going to go ahead and count by fours instead because all of these numbers are multiples of four. So I'm just going to count by fours. So I'll say that this is going to be four, eight, 12, 16, 20, um, 24, 28, 32, uh, 36, um, 40, and 44. Now, since I'm counting by fours and each line is four, I'm not going to like do eight and then 16 because since we're not dealing with, with numbers like like halves and thirds, we would label all of our, our numbers there. So you see my X and Y don't have to to um, grow by the same number. Uh, and now I'm just going to go ahead and plot them. So we have one half and eight. So this line here represents one half. So there's one half and eight. Then we have one and 16. Then we have three halves. So that will be one and one half. So it's this line here and 24. And then we have two and 32. So there's my four points. Um, I would then um, draw my line going through there. Oops. You will use a straight edge when you're doing this. Uh, so I'll draw my line going through there. So now I don't know if it's passing through my origin yet. So I'm going to look at the, the relationship that's happening and seeing will it go through my origin for me to be able to determine if it is a direct proportionality. So I'm going to then from one point to the other, I'm counting down two and over one. So counting down two and over one, I would see that this point, if I added it to it, would in fact go through the origin and maintain and be on that same line. So yes, I can tell that this is a direct proportion, uh, that they are directly proportional. It did ask us to graph the data. And if we look here, you could have told that every single one is being multiplied. So one times 16 gives me 16, two times 16 gives me 32. And then you could have figured out as well, well, 16 times one half or divided by two would have given me eight and 16 divided by two will be eight times three is 24. So you could have also, if it didn't tell you to graph specifically, you could have figured out the relationship by thinking about what number can we multiply to get to them. So write an equation that represents a line. So that equation is y is equal to kx. And since we just went through there, well, we know that one times 16 gives me 16. And I know two times 16 gives me 32. Since it worked for these two, that is giving me the number then because the whole numbers are easier for me to work with. So I'm going to say, okay, well, let me see if it was the same. One half times 16 is equal to eight. Yes. And three halves times 16 does in fact equal 24. So that means each one of these X's are being multiplied by 16. So K is equal to 16. So our equation is Y is equal to 16 X. So that tells me, that represents how, like, if I want to solve for anything, that's that's what I can plug into then the software. Well, how much of an area can I cover in 20 minutes? So on. And that's what we actually do in part C. So part C says, use the equation we just found, y is equal to 16x, to figure out the area cleaned in 10 minutes. Well, since x represented minutes, that means that I'm going to substitute 10 in for my x. So my problem will be 
y is equal to 16 times 10. So then this will give me y is equal to 160, and it says square feet. So 150 feet squared is how much space, how much area I could cover this, um, not me, but the robotic vacuum can cover in 10 minutes. All right, that is it for this.